So we have um, Josh Swain, who's going to talk about now um, the, the wind farm industry as well, um, mm -hmm. about biofiling and corrosion on this project. Okay. Oh, let me get this. <clears throat> well, back here again, and I think uh, the Anthropocene age, right? I mean, we've got tons of challenges out there. And uh, one of the things is how are we going to manage them? How are we going to change basically the way we do things to accommodate the human footprint, basically? And so uh, I keep my eyes on most aspects of the ocean industry. And about a year ago, I noticed that, uh, you know, we've got this prol proliferation of offshore wind turbines. And it's a great way, renewable energy, and it's going to offset a lot of carbon, etc. But at the same time, they've been actually running into a bit of a corrosion problem. And so I looked at this, and we, we work on corrosion issues as well as biofouling, and I thought, well, is there a way we can actually capitalize on a corrosion problem to also basically enhance the, the biology? And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, because Monica Mayher, she did her master's thesis on this subject, and uh, Kelly Hunsucker, she's a colleague who works with me at, at the university. <clears throat> so, offshore wind farms. This is the Walney Farm uh, in the Irish Sea. It's the biggest wind farm in the world to date. I'm going to be talking about biofouling, then corrosion, and then uh, tell you about the hypothesis we developed basically for, for our ideas, go through some experiments and results, and, and summarize our findings. Oh, let me do it this way. So, we've been talking about biofouling and biofouling risk and biofouling management. So um, maybe a couple of years ago, I thought about this and I wrote a paper. And uh, you know, you say, OK, I've got a probability, I've got an effect, and then I've got to come up with some engineering solutions. And really, for most of this uh, time, we've been talking about fouling control. That's the solution. And, but we don't really want to sterilize the oceans, right? There's got to be another way. So the alternative, and it's something that I try to impart, you know, I teach in ocean engineering, to say, you're ocean engineers, you're going out there. Be smarter, be creative. Because actually, biofouling isn't not necessarily your enemy. You can use it. You can maybe have fouling tolerance. You can incorporate it in your design. We've talked about a lot of aquaculture, site selection. And the important thing is ecosystem services, right? Sometimes we call things a pest, but they're actually doing something from an ecological point of view which can actually act as a service to the local environment. So the other terminology I've come across in this journey is ocean sprawl. And as I said, the proliferation of offshore wind farms is extraordinary, and it's a huge ecological experiment. And if you look at, you know, the United Kingdom has led the world, these are the number of wind farms, and if you look at the Walney Wind Farm, it has now 189, let's say 190 individual units. That's 190 structures, 190 monopiles. And the thing is, is this something that we can use to improve sustainability, ecology, et cetera, et cetera? So how can we capitalize on ocean sprawl? So I then go into the literature, and I'm not an ecologist or, you know, you guys are all the specialists out here. But I said, well, what are the benefits? And I go back to the early days of the offshore oil industry. And a lot of them, especially the Gulf of Mexico, they became hot spots for sports fishing. Because fish accommodate around there, so you have artificial reefs, increased biomass, fish aggregates. You can actually do aquaculture out there too. Habitat heterogeneity, you increase diversity maybe. And then the ecosystem services, biomineralization, I mean, is that carbon sequestration, food habitat, and water filtration. I mean, if I look at it, I, like the glass half full, I say, this is good stuff, right? But then the challenge is, is habitat modification. I don't even want to go there because I don't understand it, but I think a lot of you out here do understand it. Hydrodynamics, seafloor, geology, ecology, and we've also seen stepping stones for invasives. So, it, you know, what are we going to do, right? It's a problem. So, ecosystem services. Like most places in the world, the part of Florida I live in has challenges. Development, urban sprawl, the lagoon basically has gone from a pristine, there used to be a little fish shack at every causeway, to somewhere with turbid waters. So what we did here is, these are just oyster shells. 
with just common fouling or organisms on them. This is the lagoon water, and this is time lapse with just these couple of shells in the tank, just showing how effective they are at water filtration, right? Without these little critters here, who's going to be filtering the water? And I think you'll see there's quite a difference in the two tanks. Very simple. But they do form an ecosystem service to the environment. And the other thing I want to talk about is in the early days of the oil field, especially off the California coast, there was an enterprising gentleman called Dr. Meek, and he said, wow, there are mussels growing on these uh, structures. And he uh, got Phillips Petroleum and also Chevron to actually allow him to harvest the mussels. And they were selling, this is 1980s, right, five to 6,000 pounds of mussels weekly, harvesting from the structures, and therefore also acting as services to the offshore industry because they were keeping the structures clean. So there's the possibility of, if you like, you know, taking a fouled structure and also using it for aquaculture. The uh, platform hill that was actually removed in 1996, I think because of platform removal, I can't find any record of, uh, of anyone actually being in active industry in this now. So there are benefits, right? So from a biological point of view, we're putting all these structures out there. Can we manage them in a manner which is profitable to, to society. The other challenge you have with any steel structure you put in the ocean is corrosion. And these structures are massive. This is a typical example. You might drive one of these things in a 30 meter water depth. They're actually about 68 meters long, so 38 meters are going in to hold this whole structure support. Uh, 80 plus millimeters wall thickness, they're huge, made of steel, and you can see the fellow here, and the monopile basically acts as the support for the nacelle and rotor, the turbine. The blades on the biggest one, I think they've now got eight megawatt turbines with about 150 meter diameter blades. I mean, it's just amazing when you think of it out there. And that's supported by a tower, and there's a transition piece between the monopile and the top side. So corrosion. Corrosion on the monopiles actually was not a problem externally, but it turned out to be a problem on the internals of the monopiles. And the reason being, a lot of the recommended practice you use as an ocean engineer comes from the certifying authorities, American Bureau of Shipping, Detnault, Veritas, Lloyds, etc. And DMV had a recommended practice that said, well, corrosion protection would not be needed within the internal part of the monopile because if you encapsulated it, there would be no oxygen. Well, what drives corrosion? It's oxygen. Oxygen is hungry for electrons. I should have put the equation up. But if I'm hungry for electrons, where do I get them from? The little old iron atom you know, in the steel leaves as a, a metal iron, and it releases electrons. That's what drives corrosion. If I remove oxygen, theoretically, and we can do this in practice, I prevent corrosion. But what they didn't anticipate, there's no such thing as an airtight monopile. You've got penetrations, you've got a whole bunch of other things going on. So what they ended up with a very unpleasant chemistry within the monopiles themselves. So we were talking about this, and also then they said, well, how are we going to solve this? To prevent corrosion in the marine environment, you just apply cathodic protection. You can either do that by impressed current, or you can use, you know, most of you have seen zincs on propellers and outboard motors and what have you. You can use a sacrificial metal to prevent corrosion. When they did that, they found they had hydrogen sulfide formation with inside, water acidification, and localized corrosion. They actually compounded the problem. So we're talking about this. I said, you know, why don't we perforate the monopiles? So we came up with these two hypotheses. A perforated structure will create an environment with more favorable corrosion mitigation, air quality, and water chemistry compared to sealed structures. Because one of the other problems is if you're creating H2S, you actually create a health and safety risk. Any personnel going into that environment can die. I mean, H2S is not nice stuff to work around. And the other thing is a perforated structure will create a habitat for marine life and recruit a diverse population of settled and mobile organisms. It's great, right? So what are we going to do? Let's go and go and see what happens. So as I said, Monica, you know, 
I, I rely on great graduate students. I mean, nothing gets done without graduate students. So we took one meter long steel pipe, 15 centimeter diameter. We took four of them. One we sealed with no cathodic protection. That's the original design. One we sealed with cathodic protection. And then the two others we put perforations in. We just actually cut out six holes. And they're about a four centimeter diamond holes. Two at the top, two middle, two at the bottom. And we suspended them in the water so that the top you know, acted as an airspace. And at the bottom we actually put some sediment to try and scale, create what happens in your actual monopile, which you see on the right here. So within each steel pipe, we then suspended some monitoring coupons. We suspended steel coupons at the top, center, and at the bottom. We could monitor them with what we call silver silver chloride reference cells, and we also had the ability to drive electrical current through them for, we did, we did a lot of other stuff on them, which I won't get into now. And this is an example. This, we had uh, three steel samples at, at each level, which we could do weight loss, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this is our test site. I've sort of showed it to you before. We're on the east coast of Florida. We base our work mainly out of Port Canaveral. We're based at the marina here at the west end of the port. And basically, we rent several slips at the marina. Actually, it's less expensive than doing anything else. And we did all the experiments on a little test draft there. And what it looked like is you have your steel pipes suspended in the water, so you have a sort of water line. You have your, all, uh, your electrical cabling and monitoring cabling, and you have data logging and all the rest of the stuff, and away you go. And just a couple more expect, you know, just the wiring and the what have you. So Monaco, being very industrious, she made a heap of measurements. She measured pH weekly with a wireside probe, dissolved oxygen, we then monitor the potential, and the potential is a way of basically uh, quantifying whether you're in a corrosion or a cathodically protective regime. We did potential dynamic polarizations, and at the end of the deployment, we basically observed the difference in the habitats and weight loss on the steel. So that's basically it. So dissolved oxygen. And here's dissolved oxygen during the uh, time of the experiment from August through to the end of September. That's ambient water. You see it declining, and that's because the water temperature's increasing, right? Just simple. It's the same problem you have with salmon farming, right? Water goes up, temperature goes up, oxygen goes down. If we look in the sealed pipes, well, it's great. That's what you'd expect, too. Sealed pipe, freely corroding. Sealed pipe, cathodically protected. Both uh, very little oxygen. Perforated freely pipe, the red line there, and the perforated um, cathodically protective pipe, they all basically get a little bit lower oxygen concentration than the ambient seawater because we have marine life in there now. There are fish in there, crabs, little prawns, a whole bunch of stuff going on, uh, respiring away. The other thing we looked at is we look at rest potential. And again, from a corrosion point of view, what you do is you say, you use a reference electrode. In seawater, most of you used to use silver silver chloride. And you basically ground out your pipe to your uh, voltmeter. You put your reference electrode in the water, and you get a potential difference. By measuring the potential difference, I can see if I'm more negative down here in the green line, negative about 9 to 1,000 millivolts, I've got no corrosion. I have cathodic protection, immunity. And the other ones I have corroding. So basically, it's a way of monitoring the condition of your steel. And it just showed that our cathodic protection design using zinc sacrificial anodes were working. Well, at the end of the experiment, I'm not showing you all the data. Here's our sealed, freely corroding um, system, sealed with cathodic protection, perforated, freely corroding, perforated with cathodic protection. This is actually black sulfide corrosion products. This is actually almost a zinc carbonate buildup, which you get. Here we have fouling, but corrosion. And here we have actually quite healthy fouling communities, but no corrosion because I've cathodically protected the steel. And actually, there's a whole other system out there, biomineralization and biorock, if any of you got into that technology too. And if we look in the pipe, freely corroding, 
seal pipe, cathodium protected steel pipe, we got exactly the same chemistry, basically, that they found when they measured them in the real life North Sea structures, which said, great, you know, we're basically our scaled down experiments were very much following the chemistry which they'd observed in real life. And then if we go for the perforated pipes, freely corroding, zinc sacrificial anode, you probably can't see it here, but again, we've got this bio community which is very well developed, very healthy, and it's holding on to a substrate which is not continually exfoliating, which you get when you get corrosion. Our perforated pipes, we always had little fish, crabs. I mean, it was a bustling hive of activity, what can I say? Which really, I mean, Monica's an engineer. She couldn't believe it. She said, wow, I actually like biology. I start to understand it. You know, engineers often don't understand it. So again, we looked at, uh, at the end. We, we dumped everything out. So we pulled the pipes out of the water and we collected what, what was in them. Perforated freely corroding. We found this munch of, of, we'll say, free associated organisms. But you can see the steel coupons, a lot of corrosion. And every time you get fouling occurring, it would fall off. And one of the other things is, if you look at the base, the biological deposition then formed an anoxic mud. Because everything that fell off and fell down to the bottom died, right? Compare that to the cathodically protected pipe. Lots of little shrimp, fish. As I said, you know, the fouling forming on that steel was totally stable. And if you look at the sediments at the bottom, not anoxic, totally clean. So, conclusions, right? I haven't shown you all the data, obviously. But really, perforated monopile interior walls can be more easily and predictably protected from corrosion. From an engineering point of view, that's great. They will also potentially provide a region which is healthy as a marine habitat. I don't know, is that good or bad? The point I make, because I you know, educate engineers all the time, is that I think we really need to share the knowledge of the biology and the challenges you face to allow them to be more creative in basically how they design and how, I'll say, ocean sprawl carries out on into the ocean. Is this a positive or are the negatives of it being, you know, potential stepping stone for invasives, invasives which, is the, which is the more positive? I have no idea. But I think the debate should be is that ocean sprawl needs to be engineered and managed in a way that complements the local ecology, increases sustainability, and maybe starts to offset the human footprint. I mean, that, that, that's basically where I'm going. So I was very excited. We got the inno well, we got one of the Innovation of the Year awards at the Corrosion 2019, National Association of Corrosion Engineers, for those who, who don't know about it. So. Uh, Monica made me famous, and we've published our findings in materials performance that came out in the August edition. So uh, thank you for letting me share that with you. For, for, for